Uh, Kate McGrath, Director of Fuel, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. You set up Freelancers Task Force. Can you just tell me a little bit about what that is? The initiative came out of lots of conversations that we were having uh, with freelancers who work with Fuel. Um, and uh, we've been meeting every Friday since March or something um, with, um, with those freelancers. And, um, and I guess we were hearing from them that there was a need um, for a few different things. Uh, the first being just information, knowledge, sharing, um, communication. Particularly early on in this crisis, I think the flow of information was problematic and so we were we were hearing them going we just want to know what's happening um, and that was partly about flow of information from organizations but also from from government and from dcms and arts council and so on so it was just a, a lack of information and knowledge the second was obviously and continues to be around financial security the need for advocacy and lobbying at, at every level around what what freelancers need and then I guess the third area was was about having a seat at the table in conversations and being able to represent the case of freelancers in the kind of conversations about uh, what support the sector needed in this crisis, but also in how we build back better, as it were, how we how we build for the future in a way that includes yeah re representative voices of freelancers who just weren't necessarily in those conversations. So, so how many freelancers are, are on the scheme? So there are uh, ar around 165, 169, something in that territory. Sorry, I should know that. Um, but there are 150 organisations who are each sponsoring a freelancer. And then that some of them are in job shares. So the, the initiative of the task force came out of an open letter that we wrote to theatre and performance makers, which all of those organisations signed up to, which was essentially pledging those three things information advocacy around financial security the initiation of a task force which would give people a, a, an opportunity to have some paid work and some paid time to, to have conversations to do research to join up together around campaigning and that's what they've been doing so there are as, as, as i say there's over 160 members of the task force they're based all over the country they are from all different disciplines and they are quite a, a diverse demographic as well they're a really really extraordinary group of people and they all have basically a day a week for three months um to to work on their own in their circles of freelancers in their communities um but also together where they want to align so they spent quite a lot of time finding within the task force what are the areas that they want to work on together and who are they going to work with with them on doing research and and joining up uh, the dots um with some of the organizations that are doing lots of lobbying so They've talked with UK Theatre and SALT, um, with the Arts Council, with Equity and Beck2. Um, so they've been really trying to kind of connect in, understand what's happening, where the lobbying is, is at. Um, and also they've done quite a lot of research amongst freelancers, wider community around what they need, um, what they want, both in terms of the financial predicament that so many people find themselves in, and also around relationships with organisations. For example, they've been working on a kind of uh, a guidebook recommendations for how organisations can work better with freelancers in the future. Right. From the conversations One Voice campaign has been having, the frustration has been very palpable about the, the lack of information over the last few months. Why do you think the flow of information into the sector has been so difficult? Um, well, I think, I mean, things have, things have have moved quite fast so I think the situation now is very different from the situation four months ago and I hope in in positive ways in 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 some sense certainly to start with I think it was a crisis uh, nobody was really sure what was happening um, I think there's probably a sense or a perception from from freelancers that organizations knew more about what was happening than they did which wasn't necessarily always true there was a lot of people in organizations also unclear about what was happening um, but then as information started to emerge or at least conversations were happening 
I think organizations, some, not all, I mean, you know, the, a lot of organizations have been uh, fantastic and there have been some really extraordinary initiatives to support freelancers. But I think some organizations who were facing financial cliff edges, you know, insolvency, redundancies, everything else, were uh, initially just kind of overwhelmed by by that situation, closing their building, cancelling all of their programs, you know, kind of crisis management. And in in that in that moment, not everyone was was good at or able to communicate um, with a wider freelance community, or perhaps harder to to gather. I think organisations that already had a kind of um, mechanism or a structure for doing that find that easier earlier on um, but but those who maybe didn't already have regular conversations or meetings or or routes to communication with freelancers took a little bit longer to work out kind of how to do that and um and to find the resource to do it and then you know as time has gone on i think the initiatives like the freelance task force have helped and and others like freelancers make theater work um, and, and I think organisations have demonstrated a real, through initiatives like this, which 150 organisations have supported, have demonstrated a real desire to kind of help with lobbying and advocacy and, and to recognise the kind of the ecosystem. And I think that's been much more kind of dominant and prevalent in the media and the press a lot. You know, we've been talking, everyone's been talking a lot about the ecosystem and how everyone's interdependent and interreliant and it's a complex sector and we need to work together in, in new and different ways um but you know it, information flow from the top has not been that clear or consistent so <laughs> there's that difficult. as well <laughs> it's been difficult hasn't it you know with information trickling down through the industry all the way to the bottom but do you think there's also been a problem with communication outwards to the public about just how difficult the situation that the sector faces is. Yeah, I mean, I think the public campaign for the arts is a really fantastic initiative, which is aiming to do exactly that. And I think, it, again, um, just in the same way that organisations weren't initially able to communicate brilliantly with freelancers in all cases, partly because they didn't know what to communicate. I think similarly with audiences, the only thing that, that people heard initially was, you know, everything's cancelled and and now that you know as time's gone by i think there have been some really brilliant uh, efforts and, and initiatives from you know national theatre at home to the public campaign for the arts in different ways kind of uh, making the arts and theatre visible and um and saying you know we're still here we still exist <laughs> we still um we can we still want to connect in every way that we can but there are all these reasons why it's incredibly difficult for us to do that and I guess I, I suppose social media generally in, in some ways has been an incredible way of, of people organizing and gathering and, and spreading information. But it's also it has that bubble uh, issue, which means that, you know, sometimes we think everybody knows what's happening in our sector because our you know, streams are full of it. But but actually outside our sector, people are, are less clear what's happening. Do you think it's likely that most venues will stay shut until next year? Um, it depends what you mean by stay shut. Um, <laughs> so there are lots of venues who are, um, who are, who are opening uh, their spaces for um, communities to gather in or uh, socially distanced rehearsals or um, uh, they're opening their bar or their cafe in order to try and to generate some income and, and create some uh, space for their community but all socially distanced. Um, there are also venues uh, including the National Theatre and Bristol Vic and others who are starting to announce socially distanced performances indoors and in fact uh, we are part of the Bridges first season of socially distanced indoor work with um, Inno Allen's An Evening with an Immigrant which is opening in September um, so there are there are buildings reopening but what um, what it's possible to do is very limited and I guess that means two things. One is that lots of buildings won't be able to reopen because in that sense for performance or at all, because it just doesn't quite stack up for them to do that. And um, bringing, bringing staff off furlough or, um, or, or 
paying the costs of reopening the building with the uncertainty of the possibility of a local lockdown with the costs involved in just kind of reopening is going to be something that some buildings will only be able to do when they're really confident that they can stay open once they've opened uh, that said there are lots of buildings that are opening for whatever activity they can they can muster um, and some that have never closed in that sense that you know have have closed for what they've not been allowed to do, but have uh, transformed themselves like Eden Court or um, the Holbeck, where they've done, you know, they've been open throughout creating incredible kind of opportunities for their communities. How does the, the guidance for the application to 1.57 billion to the, the Cultural um, Rescue Fund, how does that affect your organisation? Will you be able to apply to that? Yeah, we are in the middle of writing our application for that, and it's critical uh, and crucial for us. Um, we weren't able to access the Arts Council's MPO emergency funds um, because uh, we couldn't demonstrate insolvency by the 30th of September, which was the, the kind of criteria for that, um, because we had some reserves um, and we furloughed 47% uh, of the team. Uh, so we, we haven't had any um, Arts Council or government support beyond our standard MPO grant, which in our case is 9% of our turnover, 9% um, of our income. So um, we desperately need um, support from this um, uh, Cultural Recovery Fund. Um, and how, and you, the guideline, how do the guidelines affect us? Well, I mean, I guess we'd we're just trying to follow them and make the best case that that we can and be as clear as we can the need is demonstrable in the figures <laughs> so i think the the budget and the cash flow uh do tell the story for us without um too much need of narrative but of course we're we're demonstrating our cultural and national significance and our contribution to le the leveling up agenda which is you know in our case about the fact that 80 percent of our work happens outside london can you help me to understand the relationship between a producing company and a venue in terms of the economics that we're talking about? If the real problem is the fact that you can't sell more than X percentage of the tickets, is that the biggest problem for the venue or is it the biggest problem for the producing company coming into that venue? I mean, both really. Again, it comes back to this, uh, you know, interdependency of the, the ecosystem. Um, all producing companies are different, all relationships with venues are different. Um, in our case, um, so Fuel uh, produces a programme of, of new work um, by uh, contemporary artists and we, we start with every project at the very beginning of the idea and we support the, um, the artists who are involved in that, the theatre makers of all kinds, in developing that idea through to the point where we all kind of know what, what it is and then we find partners um, often venues but we also make site specific and outdoor work and digital work so we do different kinds of things but where it's something that that um, uh, that might happen in a venue we will then essentially look to work with partners whose audience we're trying to reach essentially so we'll 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 we have long long-standing relationships with some venues where we are committed to trying to create work for example for more diverse audiences um, and we'll work together over multiple projects over multiple years and then other other times we'll we'll be creating a project and we'll be looking for a very different kind of uh, audience or or relationship it's also about the physical space inevitably um, and then the deal really depends on you know uh the venue and the project and you know uh who can put who can put what in in terms of both cash and support in kind and then accordingly who benefits from the ticket sales we've lost 74 percent of our income this year um in because our whole program's been cancelled so we're building from from that point wow does that inevitably mean that even if the theatres and venues can get open and put stuff on, that we're going to be on a diet of one or two handers for the foreseeable future? 
Uh, well, certainly initially, um, our first show in, in a theatre is a, is a one-hander, uh, but that's not, not purely because, because it's cheap, it's also about immigration, which feels incredibly important at the moment. We're, we're aware that that simplifies things as well, so, you know, it's a, it's a one-person show, we don't have to worry about socially distanced rehearsals and, and all of that. It's also an existing piece of work, so whilst it's being brought up to date and a adapted a bit, um, it's not it's not something that we're starting from scratch. We are developing lots of other projects, and they're not they're not all one handers and two handers. Um, but I suppose what's what's underlying your question is, you know, are the economics going to mean that it's really really hard for us as a sector to produce ambitious work of scale with big companies and so on? And I think there's there's undoubtedly some truth in that 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 people are going to struggle to 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 put those things together. That said, ever the optimist, I would say that there is generally um, a consensus view that we are going to spend money on people where we can um, and not uh, everything else that makes a, a production expensive. I think what, would that, what would that be? What, what are the other expenses? Uh, well, I mean, well, a lot of, there's a lot of conversations happening about touring. So, you know, the costs of transporting large sets, for example, uh, building the large set and then transporting it and all of that is for us at the moment feeling like something that we would probably deprioritize in favor of uh, being able to employ more freelancers. Um, I mean, these things are all interrelated because of course, if you build a large set, you also employ freelancers to paint it and build it and all of the, all of those things so it's not straightforward but i guess as a general rule i th i think that there is a sense of if there's available resource to make work let's get it to artists and freelancers and theater makers so that they can survive and and continue to make work do you see a future where the culture we consume is just more local uh, for sure, but for lots of different reasons, <laughs> not least the climate crisis and the need for us to really recognise the, the shift that we need to make to a more sustainable way of operating. Um, so I think this, this period has been really interesting for that because obviously the first steps that people can take are inevitably more local. So people are, are, are looking to, to what work they can make with um, their local communities, their local venues, local artists. Um, I think for me, I mean, I, I'm an internationalist at heart, so I think, uh, I hope that there will continue to be a relationship between that kind of local work and the, the sustainability agenda, which feels really important, and a kind of plural international outlook that enables empathy and you know enables us to to understand other people with other life experiences and and other world views um and who experience different situations so i think if we can be local without being parochial that would be good well that's a good strap line that local without being parochial i love it um do you think there's a there's an opportunity here talking to you as an optimist that this crisis might be the opportunity to change this industry and make it more representative of 21st century Britain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have like we have to. If there's if there's any good to if there's any good to come out of this incredibly difficult situation that all of us are in our own way trying to navigate and survive personally, politically, professionally, it's making the changes that have been so long needed and uh, which somehow or other have have been thrown into relief by this situation. A real combination of, you know, the the time that it's created for some people, um, but also just the starkness of the inequalities and, and how COVID has impacted different people differently. We've got to do that work. Um, and again, I'm an optimist, so I think it's happening. Um, and I think where I feel most optimistic is where I see that work happening collaboratively, constructively, committedly from people going actually we're going to just work together and we're going to get on with this and it's going to happen it's probably not totally in my view happening on on twitter it's more happening in <laughs> some of it's happening on twitter but there's some unconstructive stuff on twitter as well whereas i feel like actually behind the scenes there's lots of really not necessarily behind the scenes but off twitter there's lots of conversations happening which feel really positive
for the non-specialist who perhaps isn't engaged with theatrical Twitter, could you just say what that unhelpful stuff is? Um, well, you know, social media is the same in any sector, in any, you know, it's not, it's not just theatre that is, um, that eats itself on Twitter. But, um, you know, I guess, <laughs> I guess people, people like to share their views and sometimes they do that. And, it, you know, it's very hard to have a nuanced or sophisticated or subtle conversation about about these you know structural in you know really long-term systemic structural issues you can't really solve them in 140 characters you can just shout and um and that does some good in a way and it does it does make noise and noise can be useful and protest is important and all of that but i guess i'm interested in so so what so what are we going to do then so what next do you think theatres are the natural home of that nuanced debate that you were just referring to i mean yeah that's why i produce theatre like that that it's a it's a secular place to have those conversations um it, it not not just literally like have a debate have a political conversation but it's where we sometimes sit on our own in the dark and and witness somebody else's perspective on the world and are invited to to experience empathy and and that we've got to do that that's what we're all missing at the moment i sort of think that's partly why everyone's so angry because we we have to have those opportunities as humans to go okay i, I experience the world in this way but now I'm being given insight into the world from from somebody else's perspective, and that's that that changes my worldview. Yeah, we've all just experienced the the whirlwind of wrath from A level students and their parents about the fiasco in the last few days. But I wonder where that where that anger is from the public about what's going on in the creative sector and in the performing arts. Do you wonder where that anger is? Are they just happy with TV? Is everyone just consuming it through the screen? Maybe. I mean, I think there is there is something probably about the complexity of how it actually works that people don't necessarily understand or get. And so there's there is there seems to be sympathy and sadness, but not anger. Like people go, it's really, you know, whenever I talk to people who don't work in theatre, they go, oh, it must be hard for you at the moment. Oh, that's really difficult. But, you know, we're not the only sector having a difficult time. <laughs> lots, of, lots of other people are having a difficult time as well. Does that make it difficult for us to make a, a special case for the performing arts in terms of government help? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think we need to make a really strong case. Uh, but I also think, you know, nurses read a, need a pay rise and students need to be able to get their grades and, you know, people who are falling through the cracks need a benefit system. Uh, so making a special case, I don't know. I, I think we need to make a really strong case and I fully believe that arts and culture is going to be part of recovery and, you know, if we really want to shift the culture and we really want to build back better, then the arts has got an absolutely huge role to play in that. So it's really important. Um, but I think there's, you know, if, if we try and pretend that we're more important than, you know, nurses or teachers or whatever other, you know, we're not, you know, in the end, we need all of that, right? Um, we're part of a bigger ecosystem and we have to acknowledge that in, in, in trying to build back to some, or build forward, as people are now saying, to something better. <laughs> Kate McGrath, Director of Fuel, thank you so much. Nice to meet you.